Amazing, amazing, inspirational story. He is a civil engineer from the University of New South Wales. He's building a straight. Actually, you know what? I'm going to stop. I want to show you a video first, and then I want to read this because I, I want to do this right. Can we have a look at the video first? Let's have a look at it. have to have that strong sense of self-belief, whatever you do. You worked, you did your best, and you tried to go for the best. But you are fighting with bare hands, and you are out there trying to conquer the world with bare hands. Tomorrow the sun will come. For sure and certain the sun will come. Forget about what's happened. Look for what's going to happen tomorrow, and it's going to be a bright day. We saw this land had great potential. 7,600 acres outside a major capital city, whether it is Perth, Adelaide, Melbourne or Sydney, you won't get it. We said, let others say what they like, but you won't get a piece of real estate like this so close to a major capital city. We took it on. Yes, it was desolate. Yes, they thought we were mad. Uh, you can't do a project of this size with without passion and dedication and commitment. That is the fuel that is driving this project. There is a total dedication and passion to achieve something and to do it correctly. We are, in the end of the day, creating a society, a society which is part of Australia, a society that will have to be seen as a true, genuine society which has increased human capital. The, the whole face of Australia, which I call Australia as a changing, beautiful face, with a lot of contribution from everybody from around the world, that is what Springfield is. But above all, it's a very cohesive society. The soul of Springfield is education. And that is one value that we place a lot of importance and find your happiness in what you do and because that is where you find your peace that's where you find your enjoyment that's where you find your happiness do whatever you want to do be persistent don't give up don't ever give up Friends, it's wonderful to be with all of you here today. My thanks to Greg and his team, Global One, for having done such a fantastic job. Give them a round of applause, please. I know you have great speakers today, and I do know Dr. DiMartini is a very fine person. Friends, as happy as I am to be speaking today, I will be even more happier if you walk away having learned something. Just by being here, you have made a conscious choice to succeed. This is a first step in discovering the greatness that's already in you. You could have gone to the movies, you could have gone shopping, you could have done anything, but you chose to come here. And in having made that choice, there is something inside you that says, I want to do better than what I am. If you are looking for some mystical and magical formula, that is something I cannot give you. 
But what I can tell you is that I grew in abject poverty. I grew in a village that had no electricity or running water. And I studied under a kerosene lamp. I was not a naturally gifted student or a natural academic. Thankful for my upbringing because the one thing that I experience in life is hardship and failures. I have failed and failed many times. But one thing that I learned from your that I learned from your, my failures is you never ever give up. And you do learn from your failures. So don't be disappointed. You learn from your failures. Friends, here's a secret that very few people know. Are you ready for it? Yes. Hardship and success goes hand in hand. You cannot and will not have one without the other. Yes, I have found some amount of financial success, but I also know what it is like not to be able to pay your home loan, your car loan, not be able to take your wife and kids for a proper meal. I know what it is like to be able to drive from Perth to Brisbane because you can't afford a, an air ticket. You have to go through those hardships, but whatever the hardships is, just keep going. I know the feeling of being laughed at and ridiculed and said, you can't make it. That's going to be a failure. Just don't take note of it. I told my children when they were about four years old, the path to success is full of thorns. Just walk with steel boots and crush the thorns. Just get on to it. Today, I'm proud that I had to fight from the gutters and nothing but iron will and determination. Don't be ashamed of your past. Accept and build your own future. You are the creator of your own destiny. Take note of that. You are the creator of your own destiny. And you and you alone can succeed and be whatever you want to be. It's in your hands. These days, with advances in technology and with so much of educational options, can I tell you there are simply no excuses. You are looking at a man who is building Australia's New York City. And I repeat, I grew in a village with no running water or electricity. No magic formula, friends, no magic formula. When Greg Klopper rang my special advisor and wanted to have me speak today. The only reason I accepted this was I like motivating individuals. I have been through the gutters and I like to lift people up. What else can I do? And I don't want anything from you. Today, if you go home, feel inspired and motivated and you have turned your direction, I'm so happy. Even if one or two of you have achieved that, I'll be absolutely delighted. I very strongly believe that success is your birthright. It is your birthright. And you don't have to seek anybody's consent for that. Just self-belief and that 11 letter word, persistence, persistence and persistence. And a never, never, never ever give up attitude. Don't ever, ever give up. I know the, the chairman very well and, um, and also um, his son Naran. Um, and both of them just listen to, to both of them of how much passion they've got about what they believe in. Um, it's very inspiring. That was probably a big reason why I thought, okay, well, if I can learn 10% of what these guys know, um, I'm going to be very successful. Yeah, they're very goal-driven family. The, the whole family is, is very goal-driven and, and they're, they're, I suppose their, their personal aspirations is always to achieve no matter what, whether it's with your friendships or whether, whether it's work-life. Um, they're always focusing on making sure that they're, they're achieving in life. So. 
Friends, I was born in Watton, Malaysia, and when I was four years old, a jeep pulled outside our small little hut with two Japanese soldiers. Our Alsatian dog tried to protect the family. They shot it dead. They yelled to my father. He came out. They whacked him on his body with a rifle butt, put him in that jeep, and took him away. Dad was a British informant. He was informing the locals about the Japanese troop movements, and they found out about that. 142 went to prison, two came out alive. Dad was one of them. If there was one person who brought Dad out of jail, it's my mother. She feared nothing. She's absolutely fearless. Have no fear in you. Don't fear anything. You don't have to fear anything unless you have done something wrong. Don't fear of anything. My school was 18 kilometers, and I'll go by bus. The bus comes every hour. If you miss it, you <laughs> wait for the next hour. <laughs> <laughs> After finishing high school, dad and mom, who did not have money, I don't know what, what they, how they got it, but they paid for my trip to, from Singapore to Sydney. I landed in Sydney, a city that was moving at a million miles faster than where I came from. I soon got adjusted to it. This was a major game change in my life. And for the first time, I was in charge of my life. I could have done anything. I was in charge. I completed my matriculation and went to the University of New South Wales to do civil engineering. Friends, I have had more failures than success. When at university, a four-year course took six years. I failed my first year. I repeated it. I failed my second year. And when I failed my second year, I really felt sorry, not for me, but for my mom and dad. I wrote to them. I said, mom and dad, I'm terribly sorry I let you down. I know you have no money. And I was expecting an unfriendly letter. A letter came, and in, Dad said, Son, just keep going on. Don't ever, ever, ever give up. You'll hear that from me many a time, because I failed many more times. <laughs> and he also finished off by saying this, and I want you to take note of this. The darkest night brings the brightest dawn. We all have dark nights in our life. Some of our dark nights might be a few days, few months, few years. But when you have that dark night, say to yourself, the sun will come tomorrow. For sure and certain, the sun will come tomorrow in your life. And just keep going. Tomorrow will be a brighter day for me. Because we will all have dark nights, friends. You can't escape it. It's failures that's your best teacher. And one thing I learned out of my failures is to be resilient and relentless and having that never give up attitude in the pursuit of success. It was just about not giving up when failures come and just keep going on. This is a very strong message I would like you to take. I know we all have failures, but when you confront failures and have a difficult period in your life, just say to yourself, I have faith in myself. Success is my birthright. It's my birthright. Friends, can anybody tell who is your best friend? It's you. You are your best friend. You are with this friend for 24 hours a day from birth to death. You don't have a better friend than you. 
trust and be good to your friend and support your friend don't ever 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 undermine your friend very important have that self confidence i am an important person while at university i had to make up a few dollars that was missing when dad said dad send me money i was driving a taxi at night friday saturday sunday most of us were having parties but i was driving a taxi and i was staying with the landlord who was a irish gentleman he was a very good mechanic bani bani and i used to go to the car auctions once a month buy up an old car bani would fix it i will sell it <laughs> i paid for my board and lodging <laughs> he was happy and i was happy <laughs> it's all about survival friends the learning experience that i learned at university was that the value of education is very important and the need for persistence when you have any failures just have persistent persistence and persistence in government circles they call it the three p's public private partnerships your motto today i like you to take back is persistence persistence and persistence here i would like to quote calvin coolidge the 30th president of the united states nothing in the world can take the place of persistence talent will not nothing is more common than unsuccessful men or women with talent genius will not unrewarded genius is almost a proverb education alone will not the world is full of educated derelicts <laughs> persistence and determination alone are omnipotent the slogan press on has solved and will always solve the problems of the human race while president coolidge was himself an educated gentleman it was his persistence and determination and tenacity that made him successful so while education is important and i place a lot of importance on education it is only the start of the life's journey friends after graduating from the university I worked for the Sydney Water Board and after a year I left the country and went back to went back home and worked on World Bank and Asian Development Bank jobs for 5 years that was when I really enjoyed my life I was very successful and I was and I thrived in my job the firm asked me to set up their Indonesian office they said you are doing well we want you to open our Indonesian office a huge promotion for a young engineer of 32 years old i said to my english boss his name is cox and i said to mr cox can you give me 24 hours i'll talk it over to my with my wife and come and see you tomorrow i went the next day and i submitted my resignation i could not believe it this is the truth he wiped his tears and he bid me well try to persuade me but it bit me well and he said you have got to do what's good for you i left the room i didn't realize he rang my wife <laughs> <laughs> and he tried to talk to her and he said what's wrong with this chap can i can you talk, try and talk him to stay well she said he has to do what's good for him i landed in perth in 1971 without my family with a few thousand dollars the australia of 1971 friends was totally different to the australia that i left the mining boom that we had in the 60s was much much stronger than the one that we had just experienced and the recession was very very bad high high unemployment <coughs> i landed there engineers doctors i mean no engineers and architects and surveyors and everyone was walking in the street high unemployment i wrote 42 letters to various firms never had a reply 
I rang the Commonwealth Professional Unemployment Service many a time. The bloke was a bit fed up with me. He said, just don't ring me anymore, please. <laughs> there are no jobs. Join the dole queue. Dressed in a suit and tie, thinking that I was still heading the office in Indonesia, I joined the dole, dole queue. 30 chaps ahead of me with shorts and thongs and sleeveless shirts. <laughs> and the queue was moving very, very slowly. I was there for about eight or nine minutes. I said, I don't belong here. I don't belong here. I will not take money if I hadn't worked for it. I walked out of the queue. I said, I'm not going to demean myself standing here and collecting money. I cried and cried like a child. I left the queue, took a taxi, went home to my flat. And I was asked by my brother, why don't you take the job in Indonesia? It's still there. I said, no, I've burnt my boats. I'm going to make it. This is my new home. I'm going to make it here. Two days after that, I went and registered myself as a land agent selling real estate. <laughs> <laughs> selling real estate. And <laughs> when one door closes, another door opens. But the best thing that happened to me, I learned real estate. And for the first time, I realized that the degree in civil engineering from the University of New South Wales or any other degree was not a passport for success. You have to get up there and start running. It was at this time that I met a Swedish migrant. I tried to sell him something, but he said to me, no, I haven't got any money. I'm a migrant. I'm unemployed. <laughs> but he says, I've got a great idea. What's that? He said, I've got a great idea. We could make a fortune. I said, what's that? He said, this is it. This ruler is a Swedish ruler, he said. And at that time, Australia had just gone metric. And he said, it's one side is imperial, and the other side is metric. We could sell this and make a fortune. He said, that sounds good. So we ordered 2,000 rulers, and this is one of them, chaps. This is one of them. I still keep it. <laughs> we went from one hardware shop to the other hardware shop, trying to sell the rulers. Not much success. And when there was, when we ran out of hardware shops, we went back selling real estate. <laughs> we left Perth. Landed in Brisbane. We rented a two-bedroom house. One, one room was Bob's office, and my, the other one was mine. At nighttime, Bob slept there. That was his bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> it was very hard going for the first six months, but, but we got to know a few people, and the deal started to, started to come. After four years, friends, Nine and a half million we were worth. Wow. Nine and a half million dollars. <laughs> Two years after that, we lost most of it. <laughs> we had about hundred thousand dollars. And life is always the ups and downs. Ups and downs, you go up and down. Don't be ashamed of it when you lose anything. Just say to yourself, tomorrow will be a better day. That's when this land mass came on the market. 7,600 acres, 25 k's from Brisbane CBD. No company in Australia wanted to buy it. It was a land mass that had huge problems. It was in an area that was socially and economically very depressed. High crime rate, high unemployment, low morale, 
it was probably the worst part of this country. The only asset that was worth talking in that part of the world was the state prison. <laughs> and if at all you can develop it, you can develop only 10%. So none of the companies wanted to buy it. Most of the public companies could have bought it in petty cash. We contracted it. I contracted it. I had a lot of difficulties because I had no money. And if you want to buy real estate with no money, <laughs> have a chat with me. <laughs> we contracted it on long-term conditions and all sorts of things. The what? 7,600,000. It had all the problems in the world no approvals, and it needed a major freeway of $200 million. That's what deterred most of the public companies. They said, we can't afford it in order to open up the land. After having contracted, I grabbed hold of my planner, and I think he's the best planner in the country, and the leading surveyor, and I said to them, look, chaps, I've, bought, I've, got, I've got this land under contract. We've got to move fast. What can we do with it? They looked at me, they were actually, they felt sorry for me. <laughs> they said, what's wrong with this chap? <laughs> I said, doesn't matter, well, just go back and come back to me and tell me what to do in 15 days. He came back in 15 days, was smiling from end to end. We've got the answer. Chop it up into 40-acre parcels. No permission needed. Make 12 million bucks and disappear and mo do more harm around the country. And I say more harm because you don't want to carve up a valuable piece of real estate and ruin it and have horses and cows running around it. I said, no, I'm not going to do it. I have an obligation to this country. I want to do something with this. We went on the long journey. We went to council and the council did not want to hear us. They were nice to us and they said, you better go and see the minister for town planning. The minister did not want to see us, but anyway, we managed to catch up with him and friends. The minister reluctantly, due to a friend of his who was also my friend, drove on the land with his driver, got lost, <laughs> said a lot of four-letter words, <laughs> and he said, who the dash, dash, dash would ever live here? That's it. This is the challenge you will have in life. When you believe in something sincerely and seriously and what is right, don't ever give up. The others will tell you to give up, but you don't give up. Just keep going. Finally, I'm cutting the story short. It's a long story, but the minister tried to get rid of us. He said, other than Canberra, we have no planning instruments to approve a, to approve a city. And Canberra was approved something like 50 years ago. So they said, to get an approval for a city, you have to have a validating legislation and an act of parliament. It was all Greek to me. <laughs> but they threw that on, hoping that the last they see you. Chaps, that was not the last time they were going to see me. <laughs> <laughs> I ask you this, and I want you to think about it. I want you to think about it. Those of us who are not sculptors, we look at a rock, and we see a rock. But a sculptor looks at a rock, and she or he sees a very beautiful face in it. The face is already in the rock. The face is already in the rock. We saw this land, 25 k's from Brisbane CBD. Incidentally, Southeast Queensland is the fourth fastest growing region in the English-speaking world, according to the University of Queensland. This land, 25 k's. It was calling out to us. I'm a city, bring me out. You will have this experience yourself. You will see a lot of opportunities. Believe in yourself. Don't rely on the others. Take it on. You will see that face in your opportunities. This is what I'm here for, to try and explain to you all some of the difficulties I've had so that when you face with some of the difficulties that you may come across, you'd be able to not give up and go. So, chaps, we, we had that 
condition from the government that we had to have a validating legislation and an act of parliament. Our journey began and we had to see a number of bureaucrats. The journey was for four and a half years. I won't go through all the details. We struggled and struggled and struggled. And you could not see the premier who was, the, who was Goss, who came into power after a corruption inquiry with the premier, previous government. And I had to see him because he was the only one who could say yes. So I used to go to all the functions, most of the functions where Goss was there. And every time I see him, hello, Premier. <laughs> 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 Did that for about six months. One day, this man was very disciplined. The Premier Goss was very disciplined. And a solicitor, very, very conscious of probity. We went to a property council Australia's function. There were 400 chaps. And I said to my wife, when the Premier goes, we are going to go after him. Just hold your hand back. Don't, go, don't run around here and there. <laughs> So when he went, he gave his speech, he's a very disciplined man, he gave his speech, had his meal, said hello to a few others, was off. I said to my wife, let's go. <laughs> we went after him, he was going down the escalator of Sofitel Hotel, he was about six steps ahead of me, and I said, Premier, <laughs> can I see you? He could not say no. <laughs> Cut the story short, I saw him after six weeks, and he said to me, See, uh, see about 15 bureaucrats and all sorts of things. I'm cutting the story short, but what happened was that he was just going to approve the project when he lost power. Goss lost power. Everybody thought Goss would stay there for at least 12 years. Goss lost power. New government comes in, the LNP. They did not want to see me for a, for a year. You will have these problems all the time, but don't give up. We followed the bureaucrats, and many a time, the planner and, my, and myself would go and see the bureaucrats. They were on a different planet. I won't say high or low. They were on a different planet, and I was on a different planet. They could not understand what we were trying to do. We are trying to get an approval for a city man, and I, can, I don't blame them. They are there to protect the state, but they were not with us. We had a big, big gap. I would come back to the office and I'll say to my staff, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. <laughs> <laughs> we kept going. This is the difficulty that you will have in life. I'm only explaining this because I want you to not give up. I don't want you to give up. You will have many who will, who, who will have to say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. <laughs> it went on and on and on. And finally, you may not believe it, the new government decided to take to parliament. We have 89 parliamentarians, we got the government, the independence and the opposition. And that day, because it was such a major, major exercise and approval, all the 89 turned up. Normally it's about two or three or five may not turn up. They all wanted to know whether we were going to give approval to this new city. Went late into the night, debated, a lot of, lot, of, lot of words were said because they weren't very friendly to each other. <laughs> but finally, chaps, go and look at the Hansard. All the 89 hands went up. Wow. All the 89 hands went up. And for the first time in the history of this country, a city was given birth that night, other than Canberra. And that's the journey. Wow. <laughs> Government loses power, the market drops. <laughs> you have to keep going. It went on where the sales actually dropped very badly. We ran out of money to pay the interest to the bank. After 15 months, the bank was fed up with us. They sent their senior banker from Melbourne to Brisbane, and the bloke was very nice to us. He did not listen to anything. I told him we are building a city and so on and so forth and all that. He was just looking at the sky. <laughs> and after about 20 minutes, he said, you owe me money. You haven't paid interest for a long time. 
we want to have a management team to manage your affairs. Actually, he meant a liquidator. <laughs> Can you pay in 30 days? If I had said yes, if I had said no, he would have hung me there and then. But I said yes, and chaps, my second trip to hell. <laughs> the second trip to hell, and I'm burning. And while I was burning, I saw chaps from my first trip still burning in hell. <laughs> <laughs> they were all burning in hell. <laughs> Somehow, we did a deal with a public company, and I got out. Now you know why I'm this color. <laughs> I've been burnt and burnt and burnt. <laughs> We got out of hell, <laughs> hell <laughs> came out, and work started, and so on and so forth. Things kept moving for another two years. And then there was another condition that the council had imposed. No more development until you build a $200 million highway. How do you build a $200 million highway when you don't have that money? Now, there's only one chap who could approve it, and that was the new premier, the premier Beatty. You might know him. He was there for nine and a half years. And you could not see Peter Beatty. You couldn't see him. There was no chance of seeing him. But I'm used to that. I know you got to get them somehow. And there's <laughs> so no point going and telling my wife I can't see him. <laughs> but Premier Beatty goes on trade missions. And as a company, we are entitled to go on trade missions with the Premier. So I paid my fares, and I got registered to go on a trade mission. This time, I was going from Brisbane, K, uh, Brisbane, Singapore, Singapore, KL, KL to Hanoi. Two days before the trip, I rang his protocol officer and said, I'm going with the premier on this trade mission. Can I sit next to him? <laughs> premier Beatty's wife is Heather Beatty. And this chap said, is your name Heather Beatty? <laughs> I said to him, it's not, but I can change my name if you want to. <laughs> Chaps, I went on this plane flight. Brisbane, Singapore, Peter didn't sit with me. You know, we met and said hello and all sorts of things. Singapore, we stayed there for three days. We were, we were entertained and all sorts of things. Singapore to KL. Again, he did not sit next to me. KL to Hanoi, he knew that he had to see me. <laughs> okay? So he came across, and I showed all, his, all the plants and everything else. And that's why I was there. I was only there to sell him what we had to do. Showed him all the plants. I was ready for it. And across the aisle were two of his bureaucrats. And uh, they discussed the, the subject while the plane was flying to Hanoi. <laughs> and to cut the story short, six weeks after that, the government said they will consider the project because it was of state significance. It was opening up a big region, a wide region. They said, it's not for you, but we are doing it for state significance. And after six months, the road started under construction. So chaps, you will have your ups and downs. You'll be caught in the whirlwind of politics. You'll be caught in the whirlwind of finance. You'll be caught in the whirlwind of a lot of other things in life. Don't think it's going to run away. But always say to yourself, tomorrow will be a bright day. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Now, the project is moving very fast. It's had a 22-year history. It's experienced $9.7 billion worth of expenditure. Please come and have a look at it. You are my guest. I would love to show you that. And uh, there's a rail line that was just completed eight weeks ago at $1.2 billion. We are putting a lot of emphasis on education. And education is the key to this nation. Education, training, and retraining. I am doing everything I can 
to help in education and contribute my little bit to make this great country an even greater country. I'm really committed. We have the first indigenous school, a comprehensive indigenous school that we donated the land, and that's also there. We have to help our underprivileged. We have 12 and a half thousand students. Our aim is to have in this city 45,000 students. We are on track. And 44.6% of our community are in one form of education or the other. The state government knows it. We are doing the government's job. I've got support from state and federal government. Those of you who are parents, you'll, you'll know this story very well. I was once sitting next at a boardroom lunch with the director of prisons, and I said to him, what's that one thing that drives a person to prison? And I thought he will ramble on for half an hour, but the immediate answer was they can't read or write. That's why people land in prison. Those of you who are parents, you know how hard it is to bring a child to 18, 19, 20, 21, and to see this person locked up in prison. Wasted human resource of both the parents and the, that person in jail. And it costs the state 165,000 a year. Give me $35,000 and I'll educate the child and make him a better person and productive person. That's what we are doing. We are driving education very hard. We are committed to drive education. You will see that when you see the project. We are driving health very hard. We've got 130 acres or 52 hectares devoted to health. The most comprehensive manner of health we started with a 1,200-bed hospital with 2,500 aged care beds, which will be under construction soon. And all forms of human health care in one spot. The ultimate cost of this project will be $4.5 billion. As a motto that I'd like you to take, which I strongly believe, chase the success and money will follow. Don't chase the money. Just the success and money will follow. So education is number one. Education is a currency of the future. Education is the only currency that you can bank anywhere in the world. And education is the only currency that cannot be stolen from an owner. Yes. Just think of it. Yes. We are committed to education. We are committed to education. Now, the third cornerstone of this project is IT. As you know, 22 years ago when we started the project, there were no email and hardly any mobile phone was talking. There were, there was, that were there were for that big. <laughs> Today, we can't do without both of them. The world of technology is going to move very fast. Have a look at it. We've got the, the most leading data center in the country, which is equivalent to the data center of the Department of Defense. And there's a lot of IT facilities going in. Friends, I'm coming to an end, but we live in a great, great country. A country that is two-thirds the size of India and China combined in land area. They have also a lot of deserts. A country with unlimited natural resources, which the world is screaming for, very hungry for. India and China has got a population of 2.4 billion. We've got a population of only 23 million. 1% of the population of India and China controls this massive wealth. Four and a half thousand kilometers of pristine ocean frontage. Great climate. And above all for me and for you, a country that respects human rights, where in the eyes of the law we are all the same. Where else would you get it? You have no excuse but to do well. You have no excuse but to do well. And I mean, you have no excuse. That's your birthright. So in conclusion, I ask you to think, be always very positive. Don't let negativity come into your head. Avoid people 
who talk negative things and always think of these five items. You are whatever you want to be. Persistence, 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 number two. When you fail once, twice or ten times, just keep going. Never give up. That's third. Fourth, the darkest night will bring the brightest day. Fifth item is success is your birthright. It's your right. It's your eternal right. Friends, I will leave you with one saying from a famous French philosopher, Descartes. I think, therefore I am. So think big and you'll be big. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah.